All right, hello, hello. Uh, welcome back to Common Unity. This is the second episode. Uh, we're here with a very special guest, none other than the audio manipulator. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I'm, I'm happy you came on, you know. Um, so you, you've been in the Miami scene for, for a while now, no? Yeah. Um, so how, how long, like when did you first start being uh, a part of the scene? I want to say DJing coming up on like eight years now, but okay. I've been around. I was doing hip hop earlier in my career, just doing like production and stuff like that, working in uh, studios and things like that. Just basically running for cigars and beer, whatever they could <laughs> let me do to get some free studio time. Okay. So then you, you started off kind of like, um, like a producer, it sounds like, more or less? Yeah. I never DJed until it was a necessity, basically, just to get the people to hear my music. Okay. Because if not, I would just stay home. Yeah, no, that's fair <laughs> enough. I mean, it's really hard being out here as like a producer. Um, I feel like, especially in Miami, uh, a lot of people just don't get credit. Um, or just, you know, ripped off kind of deal. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, but I'm glad you ended up finding like the side gig of, of DJing. But let, let's go back a little bit more. Um, so where where are you from? Like, what's your family? Oh, my mom's stuff? Cuban and my dad is Dominican, but I was born in New York and raised in uh, South Florida. So I okay, would just nice. say I'm, I'm pretty white, <laughs> pretty Caucasian. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, when did you move? How long were you in New York for? Uh, I was only there till I was four. Okay. So yeah. you were basically like... Yeah, here. I'm from here. Okay, nice. And what part? Uh, from uh, North Miami. North Miami? I was originally in North Miami. Now we've just moved to Hollywood recently. Okay. Nice. So, yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. So you've been you've been here since you were like four. Um, and were you ever like very musically inclined growing up? Like not at all. No, not at all. Uh, uh, just producing, really. Like just, I would never call myself a musician. I would always say I'm a producer. I know yeah. how to like get the idea out, but I can't really play it. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't be able to play you a song off the top of my head. But gotcha. I can make a song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is different. I mean, yeah. I still think that it is an instrument, but yeah, it's not like you know, like guitar, piano, whatever yeah. it is. Not classically trained whatsoever. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But it's still something different. Um, but what was like your music when you were growing up, you know, like, um, did you, were you like surrounded, like your parents playing stuff? Yeah. So I grew up with my mom and she played a lot of different kinds of music. So we listened to a lot of rock, disco, funk, like whatever my mom was listening to at the time. Basically she, <laughs> you remember didn't, any? she didn't discriminate. Yeah. You remember any like the songs at the top of your head? Oh yeah. Artists? We used to listen to a lot of George Michaels, uh, nice. like, uh, Stacey Q, uh -huh. um, a lot of Barry White growing up, so oh, yeah. just like varied from all that type of stuff. And then I started getting into hip hop. She didn't even really get into it <laughs> until I started showing her that. Uh, did she like it? Yeah, yeah, my mom likes all kinds of music. She yeah. just likes anything with the groove. That's pretty cool. Is she still um, here or is she up somewhere else? Yeah, yeah, no, my mom still lives in South Florida. All right, cool. All right, so then you were kind of growing up with like a little bit of different taste from your mom. Yeah. Um, and then when, what was like the point where you started finding your own kind of lane of music? Uh, I would say digging through all my, my older brother and our friends' CDs. Remember back mm -hmm. in the day, they used to have like these l huge things in the house that was like a spindle that would like spin. Whoa. And you would, have mu you would have CDs. It was just like a giant thing. So my friend's uh, older brother just listened to a lot of West Coast rap. So uh -huh. we'd just skip school and I would just probably not supposed to be doing but smoking weed and just <laughs> sitting there and just listen to every cd that yeah. i could find my hands on anything with a cool cover you know yeah, yeah that's pretty cool we were like some of the the tracks that you found back then uh, we were actually listening to a lot of bone thugs okay. um like do or die a lot of like mac dre west coast hip-hop uh, Selly Cell, very underground stuff, stuff that most people now, even with my eight, being in my 30s, people in their 40s are like, how the hell do you know about this music? And I was like, well, I was just getting high uh, watching, you know, whatever my friend's uh, brother had. Like, yeah, yeah. Any CDs we could get our hands on. I was just like, oh, I need to burn that. Like, yeah. rip me a copy of that, you know? Yeah. You remember what, like, your first CD that you bought was? The first one that I personally bought, well, the one that I remember was uh, The Owners by Gangstar. It's okay. actually one of my favorite albums of all time. Damn. So I remember buying that. And then right after that, I had bought MM Food by MF Doom. Yes. yes so uh, that, that was like, yeah, like 2003 when Damn. I purchased that. Yeah, it was like in sixth grade. Damn. That's pretty yeah. cool. All right. Nice. Nice. So you've kind of you kind of uh, leaned more towards um, like hip hop. Uh, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Growing up, it was pretty much all hip hop and like uh, metal, like rock. I guess like the new metal stuff that was happening at the time, the yeah. biscuit, corn, like yeah. all that kind of Early stuff. Yeah, 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 that was huge, one hundred percent. And then, um, so you you, you start off with the hip hop and stuff, and then how did you transition into electronic as a whole? Uh, I liked electronic music early on because I was listening to, like I said, my friend's brother had all these CDs, and then. Uh, 
We would just skip school and play Xbox 360, and <laughs> he had this uh, Tiesto in Search of Sunrise Volume 4, I want to say it is. Okay. And I just didn't, I had heard Trance earlier, but I yeah. never really got into it, and we would just let the CD ride and just freaking, uh, that's when you could put the music onto the game. That was like the first thing. Oh, really? You could actually upload your music to the hard drive on the Xbox 360, so we would just jam out to Tiesto and, <laughs> and play Dead or Alive 3 for like fucking 10 hours straight, like I, just, I, just going I, crazy. I had an Xbox 360, I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah, man, you could change all the soundtracks on every what? freaking game that you had. How did I not know this? Yeah, we were doing that for everything. That's sick. So we were playing like Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, but instead of the soundtrack that they had, we were putting on like uh, All Eyes on Me by Tupac or Daz Dillinger, uh, Badass, any any like West Coast stuff. Damn, that's yeah. pretty sick. So yeah, that's like mainly where it happened. And then obviously 2012, 2013, the freaking dubstep oh, yeah, just yeah. emerged and everybody was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, I was into that a lot too. Yeah, and dubstep? Yeah. It was pretty close to hip hop. Like I found like the the drum patterns yeah. and stuff like that, and then the sound design just destroyed my brain because I was like, "How are these people making like this weird fucking crunchy ass sounds?" Yeah, like, I never heard nothing like it before. No, I mean 100% from a sound design perspective, like the dubstep is crazy. Yeah, it's very unique. Even to this day, there's not a lot of stuff like it, except mm-hmm. for obviously it itself. Um, and so then you you were producing um, hip hop, right? Um, so was there anybody in particular you were producing for stuff like that? Uh, no, I mean mainly I was just making beats in my freaking in my room And then just like when I would go to the studio that I was like pretty much like just like doing whatever I could to get studio time at I would give them beats for free because I was just like hey I don't have access to rappers like that So it was like the only people I knew were those guys in the studio Okay, so we did like a few songs here and there, but I was mostly just producing beats just because I liked doing it. Yeah, yeah, I really, really wasn't trying to like pursue a career in that because the, the beat game was kind of weird at that point. Beat Stars was big and trying to lease stuff. It was just too much of a hassle. Yeah, wh- around what time was this? Mm, like between like 2010 to like 2014 ish. Okay, so like four years. Like, yeah, so those four years after like right after high school because I graduated in 2009. Okay, gotcha. So we were trying to like go out there and sell beats to people, but it was just a pain in the ass to yeah. do, honestly. And you still stayed here for all of that? Yeah, yeah, I was here the whole time. I never, I haven't left Florida since I moved here. Damn, that's nice. Yeah, yeah I've just been stay put. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, I love Florida, but that's pretty cool. Um, so then you're, you're doing that type of stuff, um, making beats. Um, you know, doing all that, that fun stuff. And then eventually you kind of like transitioned into making electronic, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how was that? Like, So around like, yeah, I guess like around 2014, the cliche story as everybody else, uh, I went to a rave, uh, did a bunch of things I wasn't supposed to be doing <laughs> legally and was like, what the hell is this? I need to keep on doing this. Yeah, yeah. It was more of so of a thing of just like, I would always get comments on my music being like, hey man, like you make like, I like your beats, but they're super weird. And like, they're like, video game kind of music was always okay. like the thing that I got. And then I was like, oh, there's like a whole crowd who just wants to hear beats. Yeah. Like who just wants to hear video game it's music. True. I didn't even know this was a thing. So I was like, oh, I'm going full on into this. It's like, you guys just want to hear instrumentals. You don't want somebody rapping over it or anything like that. I was like, all right, I'm doing this full time. That's pretty sick. You yeah. remember what that rave was that you went to? Uh, like one of the first ones, I mean, it's, oddly enough, the the rave that like really made me get into it was uh, SMF Tampa, which I don't like. I didn't even really like the music there. I was just having such a good time because I was super, I was super drunk the whole time. <laughs> so I was like, and I'd never been to anything like this before. So I'm just like seeing everybody just doing whatever they want. Everybody's, yeah. you know, there's people chilling under a tree, tripping on acid. Then there's just some people shuffling. And I was like, dude, I didn't even know this was a thing. <laughs> I come from backpack hip hop where everybody's in the crowd like, like with their arms folded yeah. and then at the end of the night they're like oh this is the best concert i've ever been to but like you would never know if you were at the concert everybody looks like they're having a horrible time yeah, yeah. no it's a completely different scene when I, especially from hip-hop oh my gosh even to this day it's still the same exact thing yeah like i'm going to like currency concerts like back in the day like right, right. when wiz khalifa is coming out i'm going to white room which is no, no longer a thing anymore 1306 yeah. but um like i'm going to all these underground concerts like seeing Ghostface and jizza and like nobody looks like they're having a good time <laughs> and then at the end of the night, everybody's like, yo, that was the best concert I've ever been to. And then I go to this and I'm like, everybody looks like they're having an amazing time. Yeah. I was like, I'd much rather be at this. Like, this seems way fun, like way more fun. Yeah. You know? I do agree. Like, even like, I, I've never understood why people go to concerts and they're just kind of like there, just like standing. And yeah. Like, literally like, oh, greatest thing ever. Like, I'll never forget it. Yeah. It's so strange. Like, I yeah. remember seeing it. Like, like, one of the last concerts I went to, I said, saw this guy named Ritz. He's like, uh, uh, he was on... Tech Nines label at the time. It's like this okay. dude with red hair. Okay. Amazing rapper. He had just came out this album. He he raps really fast. He was doing everything. His breath control was on point and like mm-hmm. nothing. The crowd was giving nothing the yeah. whole time. And then I go home and I'm looking on the Facebook group because I was like I was on the Facebook group at the time and everybody was like, that was the best show I've ever been to. He sounds just like the CD. And I'm like, 
what the hell was that energy when we were there? Like, nobody yeah, was yeah. having a good time. Like, it looked like everybody was mad. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, all right, no, I'm definitely getting the hell out of this hip hop, this underground hip hop scene. Like, this shit is fickle. Like, I feel that, nobody's yeah. having fun. And then you go to like a, a rave and it's literally like anything can go on and like everybody's just going crazy. Yeah, you you just go sit under a tree and have the best time of your life. Literally. It's just like, just go jam to beats and sit under the tree. Nobody thinks of you differently. They'll offer you some water or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's another thing that is like very much like a community. Like especially in like hip hop shows, I feel like everybody's to themselves. Uh, like here, like like there's like a community, you know. Oh no, for sure. You feel safe. Um, but then, so then with that huge hip hop influence, right? How do you see that like uh, spilling into your work now, like today? Honestly, that's why I fell in love with like once I figured out the name for Minimal because I had like been listening to the music and then I met my friend uh, Leo. Car he goes by Car Carmona. Okay. I didn't know what it was. I was just playing these songs and he was like, oh, yo, there's like a whole subgenre called like real minimal or minimal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like these guys do a party every weekend here, like on mute. And I was like, what? There's like a whole thing going on here. I'm like super naive to all of this. And I'm listening to the music and it's just micro sampling. I, originally, that's why a lot of it was labeled under micro house. But mm -hmm. it's essentially what I was doing with Boom Bap is I'm just grabbing samples and doing little three second chops mm -hmm. and then just kind of tweaking that in a way to make something completely different. So mm. like it, it felt like, wow, like I figured out the other side of what I was doing already. It's the same. I, I, for me, it seems like the same thing. The, the concepts are the same. A lot of those bass lines in those songs are just low pass samples. Yeah. Just like you would do on a boom bap track. It's just yeah. a low pass sample. You know? So it kind of just went hand in hand. It was like oh, yeah. flawless. It felt very similar to me. Like I, I couldn't put my finger on it up until like maybe a few years ago why it felt so similar. But I was like, this feels the same. But it's, mm -hmm. it's very different, obviously. Yeah. And then the crowds are all, almost exactly the same. As much as I love <laughs> the underground people in hip hop and in, in like the underground uh, electronic music, yeah, they're yeah. the same. We're all kind of snobby, you know? Like, oh, yeah. oh, this is that real minimal. Like yeah. I, my, my friends argue about that all the time. It's like, what's real minimal is like you're playing techno and i would say that's minimal yeah you know so it oh. always gets into that minuscule subgenre conversation no 100 percent. even to say like uh, labeling a genre for a song is one of the hardest things i can do personally oh yeah because it sounds different to everybody yeah like, that's the thing like that's why like most of the time like even like organizing music like i try and go off a of vibe because i'm like yeah. like I, I i know there's like quote unquote minimal but like it could be you know, like minimal is just completely different than the other song, you know? Oh, for sure. It's just like, think about it. Like, listen to what we were listening to in 2016. Minimal is not what people would call that today. They would be like, they were, I don't know what they would call it at this point. It was a little bit more kind of like what I'm doing now. Yeah. Which is a, a more bleeps and bloops and like kind of like glitchy sounds. Yeah. Now you kind of have more like, I guess like Stussy and Piv, which is fire, but it it's like... You, only a few years in time, the, the subgenre with the same name has yeah. changed so much that it's you true. might not even recognize it if you were listening to it five years ago yeah no and it's completely different even though it's like almost like the same thing and even people go back like to like 90s and like oh like look this is like a minimal track that like wasn't minimal wasn't even like yeah considered it wasn't a even thing. like the name for it yeah, yeah. they probably had some other name because exactly. I, I have a bunch of my friends who are older they're like back in the day in the 90s anything that wasn't house music was techno that's yeah. just how they said it it was just it's like true. it was techno or it was jungle yeah and that was it that we didn't subgenre everything it was just like yeah. we're going to a techno rave and it could have just been happy hardcore it could be anything yeah but it was not like how we are now we're like oh this is real techno or like yeah, yeah. oh we only play groovy techno or something yeah. like that you know yeah now there's like subgenres for anything mm -hmm. like even like yeah like minimal and minimal like yeah like minimal minimal is different and stuff but like there's just so many like little like subgenres and everything yeah it's just all the little nuances i guess is what whatever somebody wants to d dictate that is at this point and yeah then, and then five years it won't even fucking matter at all yeah it'll be a completely different genre like yeah. oh you guys are making uh, industrial deep tech or it's like okay yeah whatever you're calling it at this point yeah, like, yeah, yeah. it's the same shit i guess so you, you mentioned that like when you're producing and stuff you <clears throat> use a lot of like samples where do you get these samples from uh i mostly just resample myself oh wow so like I use a lot of hardware, so um, I'll just I have I use an MPC and I'll just set it up so I'm like in a in a loop mm -hmm. like a for the for my inputs and then I'll just loop myself in and then I'll just start chopping whatever I just created and yeah. then chop it up on pads. That's pretty cool. Or I'll just sample a lot of video games and stuff like that, especially for dialogue. Recently, I've just been doing that a lot, going back to like a lot of old PS uh, PlayStation One games that had like the FMV um, cutscenes. I don't know if you know what that is. It was I like back so. in the day they used to have video games where like the cutscene would be like real actors. Oh yeah, yeah. So like yeah, I found there's so much cool dialogue in all of those video games, and yeah. a lot of those games that's how they were to uh, progress the narrative in the game. So there's like three hours worth of freaking dialogue <laughs> and all these things. So I'm like, yo, I can I have a gold mine of just random samples. Yeah, yeah, especially like 
you know, like Commanding Cocker and all these games about like Soviet mm -hmm. Russia. Like I, I made a song. I might play it later. I don't know if I have it on my USB, but yeah, it's just like you get some random stuff that you'd be like, where the fuck is this from? Like yeah, yeah, if yeah. you don't, if you never played video games, you, even if you played video games yeah, hardcore, like, you wouldn't know where this exactly, is from. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like the obscurity of it. Yeah. No, I love that. And it's like the digging of it. And that's cool because it's like a very unique uh, concept of digging. You know, like people think about like digging for samples or think about like going to like a record store yeah. or like going online and buying a sample pack or whatever. But for you to do that, like from video games, it's really unique. That's pretty sick. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've always been involved with like video games very like deeply in my life. So I was just like, my earliest memories are like just playing like Metal Gear Solid and stuff like that. So I'm just like, it's got to creep its way into the music somehow. Though yeah. I don't play video games anymore, I'm still like, I'll still watch news about it. It doesn't even make yeah. any sense. Like, oh, I know what games are coming out. I'm not going to play it. But, you know, yeah. it's just so in enthralled in me. Like, just love it. I know you were like switching out the soundtracks for like um, CDs and stuff that you had. But was there any like soundtrack that you remember? From a video game that like, stood out to you? I mean, everybody loves Donkey Kong Country. Yes. Donkey Kong Country 2 has a better soundtrack, but it's not a better game. I'm okay. gonna, always going to argue that. I know everybody likes to say it's a better game. The okay. soundtrack's better, but uh, that um, Chrono Trigger obviously has a freaking fire ass soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Uh, for randomly enough, there was this, uh, there was a Streets of Rage remake for Xbox 360 that actually had some really, it was like the first 3D fighter, 3D uh, Streets of Rage. The game's not the best, okay. but the soundtrack is really fire. It has yeah. like a bunch of hip hop on it, like boom okay. bap stuff. Damn. I wish I could remember the names of the rappers on it <laughs> because it was just really obscure, just yeah. a game that I had, but it had a really good soundtrack. And then the best one is uh, Mega Man X. I think Mega Man X okay. has the best uh, yeah, soundtrack, yeah, yeah. That's a good one. in my opinion. Damn. I mean, that's, that's a cool part. Like, a lot of people, like, don't realize how much artistry, and not, even me until, like, recently, like, how every, every video game, like, has its own soundtrack and these own, like, artists, whether big or small, they're, like, creating these things for it, right? Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, even then, like, I know, like, uh, for example, like, the Minecraft soundtrack is, like, one of, like, the most, like, like well-known, like, ambient works. And even for, like, little kids, like, you're getting these kids into, like, ambient. That's still love. I mean... Me personally, I love that soundtrack. Yeah, but. no, that's crazy. Yeah, I haven't even checked that out. So now, now you give me something to oh, look into, so I can sample. Yeah, if you want some good ambient, there's plenty. Oh hell yeah, that sounds dope. Yeah, I never, I, finally, I've never got into that game. My nephew plays it a lot. Yeah. But like, it, it seems like something you could just play endlessly for hours and just be like relaxed. Yeah. Like, it's a very zen game, 100%. And it's like it's one of those games where it's like whatever you do, whatever you want, you know. And it's like I think it might be the best like selling game of all time right now. I would, I would, I would. Definitely bet on that. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. <laughs> it's, it's 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 old. It's really old. It's not. It's, people don't think it's that old. It's, I think it's like Minecraft started originally in like two thousand. No, that's Fortnite. Actually, I think Fortnite was like two thousand and ten or something like that. Two thousand nine. Yeah. I know. I think. Yeah. I think. No. I think you're right. I think it was Minecraft. I think it Minecraft. was Minecraft. It was at the early one, right? Yeah. Because yeah. my friends were watching something about it, and he's like, "Bro, that thing's been around forever. It didn't really yeah. just blow up until like much later on. It was yeah, like exactly. already servers were already like big on that. Yeah." It's got like this big community with it. I mean, and it's, it's it's such an easy game that like anybody can play. Like like adults or kids, um, and that's why like like a lot of kids growing up, like myself included, were just like listening to like this this soundtrack of like ambient and not really knowing what it was. You know, I mean, I was like I don't know, like 15, 16, I guess when I was listening to it, like when yeah. I was playing. But like it had like this influence that like you know like I'll forever forever hold. But like it is crazy how like these sounds and these songs from from these uh, like games. It's like not a medium that I feel like a lot of people put two and two together. Oh you know, yeah. Like video games and music, but I mean, and then you have like the crossover of stuff like Guitar Hero, DJ Hero. Yeah, my <laughs> friend was trying to get us to play the Guitar Hero again. I was like, please just stop. And we already <laughs> we already did this for like two years. That that two years where that game came out, like everybody was nonstop. You couldn't go to somebody's house without them like whipping out Guitar Hero. One hundred percent. It was crazy. He was like, yeah, I got the because I guess they they keep on updating the game online for like really? the the modding community. Oh so, yeah. It's like super updated. You can now like the regular Guitar Hero songs because you remember they came out with Rock Band afterwards. Yeah. They uh, added functionality for the f all the music, yeah. like all the music for it, like drums, keyboards, everything for just the old songs. So he was going through and he was like, "Dude, you remember we used to play this?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah but I'm not gonna do that again, man. We're <laughs> not gonna get stuck down that rabbit hole again. Freaking yeah. two weeks of everybody freaking just trying to be the best, beat the the high score. We're going crazy on that." Yeah, yeah, I get you. All right, uh, let, let's go back to, to uh, you producing, right? You're talking about how you, you use a lot of hardware, right? So yeah. So kind of walk us through, like, what are some of the stuff you got? All you right, see? so, yeah, like, right now, I'm, I've, like, in since, I want to say mid-March, maybe early March, I fully delved into producing solely on, like, my outboard gear and just recording into my computer. So I basically, I run everything off my MPC. I have a... 
uh, Arterial Micro Freak. I have uh, a Eurorack case where I just started buying. I just started getting into modular. It's a stupid, expensive hobby. Oh, yeah. If you don't have money and you want to get into Eurorack, don't do it. It's <laughs> stupid expensive. Um, I I have a lot of stuff. I have a Deep Mind a Six from Behringer. Uh, I have like um, the TR rack, which was basically it was the rack module of the Triton keyboard, which was like a Korg workstation from back in the day. If you ever heard any like Scott Storch or like early 2000s hip hop, that keyboard was used on pretty much everything. Okay. And a Roland XV5080, uh, which is also like a module, but that's like more for like 70s sounds. I just bought a Yamaha RX15. I, I buy a lot of synths and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. going broke. So, you know, <laughs> if you guys want to donate, you know, <laughs> there you go. Donate I, to the I, cause. I can use all the money I can. Actually, you should just buy records. Just actually purchase music from people, guys. No, it's true. Not yeah, from 100%. Spotify. Don't stream that shit. No, buy no. it from them, please. I agree. I agree. I mean, that's why Bandcamp and stuff is there because Spotify, you get nothing. You get absolutely yeah. nothing. From yeah, they eat off you. Yeah. Especially yeah. the small artists, they don't give. Yeah, protection. man, it is what it is. Like I get, everybody wants to be able to stream their songs and whatnot. Yeah. But, um, if we all have to take control back, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, I feel like if we all just sold our music, we even if it's a dollar, I'd rather get the whole dollar. I was actually just having a conversation with another artist today. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I don't want point zero zero one fraction yeah. of a penny just every really time you stream my song. I'd rather just if I have five songs sold, that's still gonna make me more money than you can sell. Uh, what I mean, you can stream like two hundred streams, three hundred streams, and you're it's not even gonna money. come close to getting five bucks. Yeah, exactly. So. That's ridiculous. Everybody I mean, just has to get off the platforms. I, I'm starting to see a lot of people doing it, so. It's true. Well, I mean, because another thing is, like, you don't own, like, those songs in Spotify. You know, you can download them or whatever you want. But, like, you can listen to them, find, like, on an airplane or whatever, but you don't own it at the end of the day. You know, it's, yeah. like, still, it, like, you're just streaming it, literally. Yeah, that's a deeper issue that we're just coming into with everything at this point, which kind of sucks. Because yeah. there's no physical media anymore for anything. So no. eventually you can just, you can purchase something and they can take it away whenever you want. But that's yeah. a very long convoluted uh, conversation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I think like it, it, it has its pros and cons, you know, like um, Spotify like allows for people to find music, like, like especially for like DJs and stuff. Or like, of course, anybody else, like just find a lot of music, like whenever. And it's, it's you know, it's a one time fee or whatever, like monthly. And you can, you can find whatever you want and however much of it you want. But like, yeah, like at the end of the day, like, you can't even use it to, to listen to, like, on your own, you know, like, you, you don't own it. So if Spotify goes down or, like, it's just gone the next day, you know, you don't have that song anymore. And you yeah. forget about it, too, you know, because you just don't have access to it anymore. No. So I do agree. And, and paying the artists, like, what they deserve, because nowadays it's even harder to, to make a living off of it, right? Well, that's for sure. It's just a weird thing because, like, I understand their point, I guess, like, big corporate point on is like how do you quantify the payment for the stream yeah at this point when we've been paying you pennies already we're not going to restructure no they're not you know they have but no it's also to. they're not a profitable company at all anyway so yeah for them it's like we're not making any money we're not going to pay you shit either yeah exactly <laughs> so it's just a weird uh little area that we're in right now but i feel like uh with the rise of a lot of people still like processing vinyls again, like, you know, just uh, there's a lot of more vinyl only releases and yeah. people doing direct to consumer, which is what I plan on doing when I relaunch uh, my label or if I launch another label. Mm -hmm. um, I think more people doing that will really like help the, the ecosystem for artists, just everybody doing that direct to consumer because you could even just get your Shopify account attached to your Instagram. And that's yeah. every time you post something, you can sell your record yeah. on Instagram. Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy, like, the digital age we're in, like, that you're able to do something like that so flawlessly and so easily. And it, it really does give, like, yeah, ex especially you, like, owning a record label, like, it gives you access to to promote in such an easy way, I feel like. Um, but going back to that, like, how, how is it um, in this day and age running a label? Uh, it's weird. It's a weird thing because I run, like, a very niche label. So, like, yeah. the music we produce isn't, like, I guess commercially viable, mm -hmm. some people would say. Yeah. So, it's just, it's tricky. You, there's a lot more money in than there is out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, it's like, you're, I mean, you're, you're spending all the money. I mean, sorry, the other way around. There's a lot more money out than there's coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you're going to be spending a lot of money maybe for no returns at all. But I, I don't do it for that. I just do it for music. That's why I'm trying to go through the direct-to-consumer because at least if we're we're going to be spending the money that we're going to get our whole cut. Yeah. I'm not going to get my fraction of a penny. You yeah. You know, like, hey, if this, the record sells for a dollar, we got a dollar. Exactly. And now I bust it down with you. Like, 
our contract's 50 50 every time i get a dollar i'm passing you 50 cents yeah or you know how however you're structured i usually do 50 50 just split it down the middle mm -hmm. much easier like that yeah i know i mean i like it's a perfect way of doing it and it's like perfect transparency you know like i agree like the artist making it and then you like um what do you call it like publishing it and yeah that's why bank camp has always been good about that because literally the second that the purchase is made the artist is already broken off the mm -hmm. uh, the other artists it's literally yeah. it just gets fractioned out right there yeah that's perfect so it's it's much more transparent than you know hey i got this freaking uh this i get this quarterly report and this is how much you made but i can't pay you out until i reach a certain threshold <laughs> That's how it works, yeah. honestly, when you use I digital know. distribution. So it just sucks because a lot of people will be like, hey, you never paid me. And I was like, I didn't make any money. Yeah. Like, I didn't even make money. Exactly. So, like, there's no way I can pay you. Like, I, I'm sorry you feel that way, but, like, like the money's held up because you didn't reach $200. That's why I'm trying to not do that anymore and just do the, you know, direct to consumer. As soon as I get the money, I'm just forwarding it right to you. Yeah. But that's, like, probably next year when we relaunch because mm -hmm. right now I'm just trying to focus on working on my own music and stuff like that because I took a backseat on myself for a few years running the label and throwing events and stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get back in there. Yeah, I got you. So then um, when you started producing electronic music, when was this around? Uh, uh, like 2014, 2015. Okay. And then when did you start the label? Uh, 2020, I think. Okay. Started right in the fucking pandemic. We got fucked over. No, I was literally going to throw a party at the Night Owl, which is now the trip. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And literally, like, the day before my event, it's like, COVID, we're going into lockdown. And I was, like, <laughs> going to throw my first Miami Music Week party. And I was yeah. like, oh, I'm so hype. Like, I don't even know if anybody was going to show up. But, yeah, you know, yeah. I was just hype, you know? Yeah, opportunity. And then, yeah, we started right in the, in the middle of the pandemic, October 31st in the pandemic. Damn. Yeah. Damn, that's rough. Yeah, because I was sitting on a bunch of music. I was yeah. like, hey, there's nothing to do. Everybody's at home. I was that's still true. working, but I was just like, hey, well, this is the time to get out music because people are watching streams and listening to music. They don't have anything to do. Yeah. So we started then. Okay, got you. So then you, you've been doing that since 2020, and then up until recently, like that was like your main focus? Yeah, I mean, up until probably like last year, we were just doing mostly the label, and I was throwing events out of necessity to like promote the artists, and then it just became more of like, people were coming more to events. So I just started doing more events mm -hmm. and kind of took a backseat on the label because mm -hmm. I was getting a lot of good music, but I wasn't having the proper budgeting because of, you know, financial situations of my own to yeah. uh, fully promote these things the way they should have yeah. been promoted. So I just didn't want to do something half ass mm -hmm. anymore. So I was like, Hey, I'm just going to take a back seat on this until I have the funds to really like, Hey, I have this freaking amazing release. I should be able to put $500 behind it. Yeah. You know, I don't want to put it out and put a, you know, a hundred bucks behind it. And then it just goes nowhere. Exactly. So I, I kind of just said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Yeah. That's a difficult thing. I mean, because like, these are like these, these small things, like these small, they're like, they're like passion projects, you know, and like, it's what we need, but also at the same time, there's no like ecosystem for them to thrive. I feel like, you know, like, cause everybody's just putting in money of their own for the most part. Oh yep. yeah. I was literally talking with an artist earlier today about, cause a lot of people didn't know, like a few years ago, a lot of, a lot of artists were doing like these scams on Beatport to get their shit charted. Really? I was contacted by many people to buy their, uh, buy their single and they'll just send me the money back. <laughs> I swear it was a no, thing. And a lot of these guys were Beatport top 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a thing. Cause you can't keep on buying it from your own account. Cause no, then that's they'll true. see. So yeah, they just, yeah. you get hit up in Facebook groups all the time. Yo, hey, send me the receipt and I'll send you the money back kind of thing. That's crazy. And honestly, a lot of those people I was telling my friend were actually super talented. So it worked out for them and yeah. they're, they're doing good things right now. So yeah, yeah. I won't say any names because I'm, I'm not. Yeah, fair. Know. But uh, yeah, I was like saying like, there's like, there's little scams. Once you figure out how this, the intricacies of how this works, that's why I also stopped doing the label thing. Because then I just started realizing like, oh, I, I was investing money in the wrong places. I started figuring out where I could have been spending my money. Mm -hmm. And I was like. This isn't as expensive as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Because I didn't realize, like, the, these platforms are so available to anybody because a lot of the thing is that nobody makes money in music, so everybody's willing to do what they can to make money in yeah, music. exactly. So everybody's willing to work with each other, like, with each other essentially. Yeah. Like, a lot of these PR guys, they're willing to, like, negotiate pricing with you. Okay. You just have to come at them in, you know, a good way and be like, hey, this is what I got, like, you know? Yeah. So that's why I, I rethought the whole label thing for, you know, to relaunch later because now I understand it a little bit better and be like, mm -hmm. oh, I could do a good release with only a $200 budget. Yeah. It's just investing those $200 the right way. I just didn't know. I was just throwing money out the window, essentially, yeah. trying promo pools, trying PR agencies, and none of them stuck. Yeah. And then I found out which ones that would work for me. And, you know, it's just a trial and error of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, like you, you it, that's a good thing is like you've taken, you had a lot of time in it, 
which is like the best way to learn and then you took some time away and now like it sounds like you know you're coming at it from a different angle and i feel like it's just something that you like is some, like always learning about you yeah. know the intricacies but I, i'm glad that you're learning how to how to do it like in a more proper way because i mean there's there's a lot of good stuff coming out of that label that needs to be like put out in the world and needs to be like yeah appreciated. thank you man i appreciate that yeah yeah no i mean I've, I've always been a fan of like the the label and the parties that you throw um i mean you've been throwing them for a while now you're saying that the first one was all the way back in in pandemic um yeah we we started well that one got crushed and then yeah. i think we started a year after the pandemic because we weren't doing any of the like we i didn't have the funds to throw any parties at the beginning and then luckily some people helped me out with getting in contact with venues and everything mm -hmm. and then uh yeah, then I just kind of went out there and just started looking for myself because originally, before the label, I used to um, throw techno parties with a few of my friends. We used to uh, do like hard techno before, I guess. Like now, <laughs> hard techno is pretty in, it's pretty popular yeah, at this yeah, point. Very. But we were doing this in like 2016, doing rooftop parties. We had like some residencies. We brought like Keith Carnell down here. We had oh, some wow. warehouses. Yeah, it, was po it wasn't popular at the time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, we were yeah. fucking losing a shit ton of money. Yeah. We're all just fucking going in on these warehouse parties, fucking doing like fucking 12 hour raves and shit, just losing a bunch of money. So I had already that experience. And then I just I kind of a control freak in the sense of that, like, I don't like I, I did the thing with other people. And then that's when I did my label. I was like, all right, I'm doing everything by myself yeah. unless I meet somebody who I feel like I can work with. Because yeah. I'd rather just all the responsibility be mine and it'd be fucked up if it's my fuck up, you know? Yeah. I didn't like relying on people because like. I don't know. I'm just, I guess, a control freak in that essence. You yeah, know? and I mean, honestly, people are unreliable sometimes, you know? I'm unreliable, so, <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Like, if it's going to be somebody's problem, it's my problem, you know? Like, yeah, I'm yeah. the one who fucked it up. I don't want to blame anybody for any anything, uh, any shortcomings, you know? I'd rather it just be all on me. Yeah. No, I get that, 100%. I, it's, it's, that's a good thing, because then, then you get total control, and that means, like, it's your, like, your baby, you know, like, your vision. Everything exactly, from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if you were, you were doing, um, like, hard techno um, in the beginning, and then... Where did that, like, where does that lead you? Because you've, you've done a lot of different parties. Yeah. Now. Yeah, so we were doing that. And then I just, like I said, I, me and my friend, my friend Carmona had showed me, like, you know, I had listened to it, but I didn't know, like, the genres. I didn't know the artists. Yeah. He showed me the minimal stuff, and I was like, I'm all in. <laughs> that and electro. Yeah. So then I met Pablo Funk, and I met a bunch of people who were doing electro stuff, and I was like, didn't know the name for it. I, like, when I was younger, I used to love, like, Egyptian Lover and all that stuff. Oh, I just yeah, didn't, yeah. I didn't know there was a whole scene for this. Yeah. So then they started putting me up on game, and I was like, oh, Minimal and Electro, that's, like, that's my shit right there. Like, yeah. that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. So we started doing that, and, uh, yeah, we've been, we've been doing that for, shit, like, yeah, like, four years now, five years. Yeah, it's going strong. Yeah. And you've, you guys have played at a lot of different places, and even places that, like, keep bringing you back what are like some of these places that you played at yeah so we have a monthly residency at kill your idol uh we're actually going to be there on friday from 11 till 4 in the morning so if you Pull guys up. have nothing to do come through Pull up. we're going to be playing after a band i don't know the name of the band right now when i figure out the name of the band i will shout them out because i feel fucked up not shouting them out but i have no idea what the name of the band is yeah, but yeah. we're going to be playing some cool music it's going to be after uh supercon right i think supercon is this weekend I so, think so. They're making it kind of like an after party. Okay, cool. And then the next night, I got to shout out my boy Lamebot. Lamebot's going to be playing there as well. Oh, so, nice. So uh, he's going to be throwing down another Supercon after party. So Sick. if you guys are busy tomorrow night, <laughs> come out on Saturday night. Hell yeah. Kill your idol. Yeah, kill your idol. It's a cool spot. It was like one of these spots. Um, I know we were talking earlier off, uh, off the, the mic uh, how like it's like this spot that a lot of people just don't really know of, but it's like a very unique spot in like Miami Beach. So like how did you come about finding this place? So oddly enough, I used to play with, shout out to my boys, American Grime, uh, my boy Sergio, Jumanji, uh, Bigsby, Gnome, all the boys. Uh, they used to do a party there. So literally, that's the first place I've ever played out. Oh, wow. They gave me a shot. They were doing their, their, their parties. Uh, they had a party called Proper where they were trying to bring all the like, different genres together because they do predominantly like drum and bass, dubstep, grime, stuff like that. But they were trying to do a multi-genre party. And I literally just hit up Sergio because I'd known him for a long time. And I was like, hey, man, like, I'm a fucking noob. Like, I'm trying to get some playing time and shit. And yeah. he was like, yo, I'll put you on. I got you on the opening slot. And then I played there. And then uh, they invited me back pretty much, like, at least, like, once every two months after yeah. that. And I've been playing there for, like, seven years, eight years. The place has changed a lot, though. It's, it's much nicer now. And the... Uh, I forgot who set up their sound system now, but their sound system is fucking killer now. Yeah, that's really they good. retuned the sound system. Actually, since you were there, oh, they really? retuned the sound system. It Even sounds more? like way better. Oh, so much better. So yeah, it's been a fun ride. 
at first they weren't uh, really hip to like electronic music. They used to do a lot of punk. Yeah. Uh, and like maybe sometimes like the like my friends had the successful party there, so the drum and bass and all that shit was popping over there. But for like yeah. house music, it really wasn't a thing until recently. Mm-hmm. Probably until we got there, like. Uh, we've been doing our residency there for uh, almost three years now. So now it's become way more acceptable to uh, uh, like more like traditional house. And I guess like, you know, that in that essence. Yeah. Especially right now in Miami, like in the past few years, like it's just every, everywhere you go is like house. Yeah. Like it wasn't, it wasn't always like that. It's always like kind of been the underground and like the forefront, but it's always like EDM and stuff like that. But now house is like the new EDM in a way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's just because people don't, want to be like i guess i don't know it's like i guess the edm stuff kind of died down because i feel like it was more abrasive to people who are not really into it yeah it's a little bit harder to digest if you're not into electronic music so like house music depending on what you're playing could be very jazzy or very like disco-y you know or it could be really like m1 keyboarded up so yeah very familiar you know exactly no and that's that's a wonderful thing about about how it's like, like you said, like EDM, it's like, you, you know what EDM is, right? Like it, it is what it is. And then house, like there's so many different, um, like, you know, avenues you can go to that. Like you can, you can find someone for anyone. You know what I mean? Like something for anyone. Oh no, for sure. Yeah. Um, so then you've been at Kill Your Rider, which you said even like back then used to be more of like a punk scene. It was pretty cool. But how is that? How have those parties been there? Honestly, we've, we've been doing really well there. We have always a really good time. Uh, we do we don't really play minimal per se there mm-hmm. it's not really the the place for it mm-hmm. but we do we stay true to like what i like which is just house music like fun house music you know shit that you can dance to yeah it doesn't always have to be like super on the nose like what i'm going to be playing later is very on the nose weird as shit minimal <laughs> ketamine vibes like, oh yeah that's what i like there but that's go. not that's not you know you're a dj you got to play for the crowd that's in front of you yeah so as long as you're playing what you like and you're not selling out and people are having a good time that's what i try to yeah. do i just try to tell everybody hey when you come here just have fun yeah play fun i'm not telling you what to play just yeah. make it fun and I feel like the crowd, the crowd likes getting into stuff that, like, of course, like is like easy and stuff. But also, like, if they see that the person playing it is like into it, you know. And the Kill Your Idol like crowd is like a very like cool, like hipstery, like chill vibe. That like they they kind of like they understand like everything you play. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like like they they didn't give me a hard time when I was there. Like everybody liked. No, no, you played you, know? a, you played an awesome set, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's but, why I booked you. I was like, I heard you play here. Actually, funny enough, that's how we met. I just you yeah. played right before me, and I was like, yo, this guy, I want to book this guy. I was like, literally, like told my girl who's back there. I was like, yo, whoever this guy is, I gotta go find out his Instagram because I like what the fuck he's playing. <laughs> I appreciate it. I mean, it, it was it was really nice for you to to go out and reach out to to give me that that opportunity. And that's another thing that I really love about you and and like the like the parties that you're throwing is that the fact that you're giving all of these like local acts this these platforms a lot of people that like like maybe haven't played that much out in public and oh, you're yeah. giving like like yeah like because you said even even earlier that, like that's what happened to you and kill your idol that somebody gave you like an opportunity. yeah everybody just needs a shot exactly give them a chance like now if you fucking if i give you a shot and you play at 10 o'clock and you slam 150 like i'm not gonna book you again <laughs> I'm, i respect you for doing yeah, that shit sick. but you know what i'm saying like you know it's time <laughs> and place you. but you know everybody everybody just needs that shot yeah yeah and there's so many like there's so much talent here like it's crazy it's like overwhelming but i'm glad that like you're giving the people that don't normally get the shot like you know their opportunity you know it's like yeah. mad props. Yeah, we got to do it, man. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah, 100%. And promoters, pay your freaking DJs, please. Amen. Pay your DJs, promoters. Yeah, fucking man. Looking in the camera at all you motherfuckers who don't pay. Uh, pay. Everybody. Everybody. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but so you, let's go back to, to you as a producer, right? Because that's another side that like, I'm really interested in. Um, you've done a lot of hardware stuff, which is like, like, it's like getting more common now. But even then, like a lot of people like kind of like shrub it off because you can just use most of the time, like laptops, you know what I mean? You just yeah. find plugins and stuff. So what really led you to using hardware? I got bored of making the same song. <laughs> I felt like I was making the same song, I yeah, swear. Yeah. The structures are the same, everything yeah. I'm painting, you know? Like, you're just looking at a canvas and you're painting it the same way all the time. Yeah. That's kind of what it felt like. I was just like, all my songs drop at the same time. They're all six minutes long. Like, you start noticing patterns, like when, yeah. like the point and click got kind of like monotonous and it's just like I felt like everything I was making sounded very similar even if it didn't musically sound similar like all the song structure was the same choice of samples was the same like I don't know I just I was just like I'm tired of doing this and I had been picking up pieces of like hardware throughout this whole time Mm -hmm. because the first big piece I bought was the MPC uh, live yeah because I had an MPC uh, renaissance before that. So that's what okay. I was using to make like boom bap beats and like hip hop and stuff. So I liked the MPC workflow. So I was like, let me continue this. 
and then I went to a couple people's studios and I was just looking at the gear that they were using and just trying to prick their brains about how all this shit worked. And mm -hmm. over the years, I just accumulated enough stuff to just fully go like, hey, like my computer is only a tool to record. Yeah. Like I don't want to do any like song arrangement or musical things on here. I just want to mix on my computer. Yeah. And I feel like the, the outcome has been so much better. The, the songs feel more natural. Mm hmm and it's just more fun honestly it's just more fun tweaking a button than yeah. like you know tweaking a knob or something than it's true clicking yeah no and you get way more feedback and i feel like you have more control you know yeah you know what I mean? yeah um, it's, it's way more of a limitation though so like the, if uh, any advice to people who want to get into hardware if you don't have a lot of money or a lot of time to like figure it out yeah maybe just buy like one piece of gear at a time yeah. don't like go and throw a bunch of money into it because yeah. it's not that fun especially with the euro rack stuff it's uh <laughs> It's very, it's time consuming and it's a headache. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, cause I mean, even now, like you see a lot of people's studios and like there's a ton of just everything like synths, keyboards or whatever. And like, they'll just go and use one, one keyboard like the whole yep. time, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's also, yeah, like I agree, like getting one piece at a time is really important. Cause I feel like you gotta like, like learn that one piece inside out. Exactly. First. Yeah. Exactly. And go one by one. Yeah. And, and don't sell your stuff. Don't there sell you your stuff. I've had so many things that I wanted to sell, and now those are like the main focal points of my studio. It's true. It's like I was gonna sell my Neutron and my Micro Freak, and then now that's like my favorite things to use because yeah. I now I understand how to use them in the capacity for what I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. I just didn't understand how to use them in the way that I needed to use them for what I'm trying to achieve at the time. Yeah. But if you need the money, sell them shits. But yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying. Like if you don't thing. need the course, money, course. just hold on to them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, because I think I think like. Like, especially with, with stuff like that, like you said, like, the, it, there comes a point where, like, people just, like, push it off to the side, and then all of a sudden they go back to it. And, like, it's like a breath of fresh air. Like, it's brand new, and you create, like, these masterpieces that you just couldn't, like, you realistically couldn't before. And, like, sometimes you do need to take, like, a little break. Oh, yeah, that's you know? for sure. That's, like, kind of why I got into the hardware, because, like, I figured out that it would take me three seconds on my hardware to make a sound that I used to, I used to have to freaking do so much post-production just to get this stupid weird glitchy sound that took me five seconds to do on hardware yeah like especially it's yeah especially the immediacy with that, with that stuff that you're making like it's like these things that are like very intricate but like yeah like hardware will get you like that but like if you go in and t manually tweak everything like it's gonna take yeah my or, automation lanes are gonna be like ridiculous if i'm just trying to get the like the little same sound that i could just plug in a few lfos on my euro rack and that's it mm -hmm. automation's already done i can change probability like it, it gets real mathematical and nerdy and shit but like it there's an easier way to achieve this with just two things than me pointing and clicking and painting all this yeah. automation in. So that's kind of why I really got more into it. Yeah. And so for, for every song that you're making, I mean, for sure, every single time is different. But where does the process come up for like uh, when you start naming tracks? You know, that's always like a fun part. Oh, like that's hilarious because uh, I name anything whatever. Yeah. At this point, I've made so much music over my life. I don't care. Me and my friend, because my friend was at my studio earlier today. Yeah. And he was laughing at me because I was trying to find the song and I was like, I don't know, the, I, I can't figure out the name of the song because I'm like been in this thing where like if I make more than one song in a day, like I've been like really honing in on making, trying to make like three, four songs a day. Mm -hmm. I'll name them the same thing just with a number at the end. Oh, okay. Just so I know, like, it's just like a, mar um, a marker in my brain to be yeah. like, hey, I made this, the, all these were made in one day. Yeah. You know, so I was like spending like 20 minutes just trying to find like this song. And I was like, oh, it was, it was number two. Yeah. Not number five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. So no, I just name it anything off the top of my head. I really don't care because the name can always change. That's you true. You send it to a label and, you know, you might change the name by the time it gets there. That is true. Yeah. yeah. You can change it at any point. So what's like your, um, your workflow uh, when you're creating in the studio? How's that? Um, in terms of what, like, like, what, like, how do I, like, what do I create first, like drums or something like that, or yeah, just I like, mean, like that for sure. But just like overall, like, like, how is it, like you go in and like where you start? Oh, I get you, know? you. Yeah, I mean, I I go in uh, with no intention at all because okay. I make a lot of different genres of music. Mostly, what I, I mean, uh, pretty much all I'll be playing is like house and like minimal kind of stuff that I make. But I make a lot of '80s music, uh, like. R and like eighties music, like eighties funk, nineties R and Bs. I still make boom bap and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I just go in with no intention, honestly. Yeah. I'm just like, I'll goes. set a BPM and that's pretty much it. Like that'll kind of dictate where the music is going. I'll be like, if it's if it's below the the one twenties, it might probably just lean towards more like eighties funk or. Yeah. And then if we're getting really low in BPM, like seventy or eighty five, we're probably gonna go like R and B mm -hmm. or something like that. What have been like your some of like your influences recently, like you know musically? Honestly. Um, 
I've been listening to a shit ton of Larry June and Cardo. Okay. I really love that mm-hmm. style, like that that West Coast style. I, I'm a big uh, West Coast hip hop fan. Mac mm-hmm. Dre is one of my favorite artists of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been listening to a lot of that. And then just a lot of 80s funk again. I really love Confunction, Daz Band, um, yeah. Clear, like stuff like that. That's actually what I listen to at home. Like most of the yeah. time people come to my house and they're like thinking I'm going to be like bumping house music. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, no, I'm just listening to like 80s funk and and maybe some West Coast hip hop, you know? Like yeah, that's yeah. pretty much what I actually listen to. Yeah. And then smooth jazz. Okay. So it's like, it's kind of all over the fucking place. No, I mean, I love it. I mean, that's that's a sign of like a true musician, you know what I mean? Like not just sticking to house because it gets repetitive. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't want to, I, I produce it all day. I of listen course. to it for like 10 hours yeah. on one song. I don't want to hear that shit all day. Yeah, like like one of the one of the like interesting questions that, that came to me recently was like I've always um, like tying hand in hand to that is like after you've played like a set for like hours like in the middle of the night you know you're like driving home at like five a.m. Silence. Yeah, just pure silence. silence. No, no music. Fucking silence. I got that one hundred percent. I get home and it's silent. I'm gonna yeah. smoke a blunt on my couch in silence right now. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Because after that, it's just so overstimulating, like, right? Like it's it's over. You know what I mean? Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. No, I agree. You need you need that little like debrief period because it just it becomes too much, and especially when you're like mixing it. It's like. Oh yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah and especially when because we throw events, so I'm there for the setup and I'm that's there to true. close down. So it's like I've been listening to house music for fucking seven hours, seven and a half hours. Last thing I want to do is jump in my car and go listen to more fucking four on the floor kicks. Yeah. I'm gonna that. go in my car and listen to absolutely nothing. Hey man, I feel that. Um, and, uh, what are, what are some of like your, your favorite like albums overall? You know, we Uh, we touched upon one of the ones earlier that. So uh, the owners favorites? is yeah. Gangstar has two places in there. Cause uh, moment of truth is my favorite album of all like hip hop album of all time by Gangstar. Um, I would say my heart by Donald Jones. I really like R and B music a lot. Um, Hmm. Stupid Doo Doo Dumb by Mac Dre. It's a fucking hilarious album. If you've never heard it, listen <laughs> to it. Stupid Doo Doo Dumb. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. It. He's like one of my favorite artists, but like I always say, like I preface it, like 80% of his music is like the weirdest, most dumb shit you ever heard, and the 20% is like the best music I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. So I always tell him, take him with a grain of salt, but you <laughs> listen to those fire songs, they're like my favorite songs of all time. Yeah. But it's like he, the guy was making ridiculous amounts of money, and he was on like, crazy amounts of ecstasy at the time i didn't even know i was younger i was listening to him i didn't understand the lingo yeah but the guy was just like on ecstasy 24 7 so <laughs> once you listen to it with that in your mind you're like okay this music makes a lot more sense <laughs> yeah, to yeah. me because it's just off the wall weird ass shit yeah but yeah stupid doo doo dumb and of course illmatic one yes, of my favorites classic, can't go wrong um yeah i mean those are pretty much off the top of my head what i can think of yeah i feel like you have like a very unique um outlook especially like for an electronic, predominantly electronic artist, of course, you still make a lot of other stuff. Um, but like, you have like, like you know how we've talked about the whole time of like your your rap influence. Like, there's like a very um, unique, like uh, yeah, like influence o- overall on on your sound. And I feel like you do you do kind of hear like I never really put two and two together. But like even now, like even through that, like it's a very unique take, and that's why like a lot of your songs are like very, like yeah, they're very unique. You know, like they're not like the others and. I feel like you grab, you take and grab from a lot of different places and you can tell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, kudos, like it's a lot of really cool stuff. Thank um, you. I mean, and I'm excited to hear like we, what you got going on. Um, but you've been making a lot of new music recently, right? So what is your, like, uh, your prog, like, what do you want to do with like that music? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm sending it out to, I'm trying to get my, more of my records signed to like other labels, but mm-hmm. like more like minded labels that like the, the weird niche sound that I'm going for right now. It's very like glitchy and dark and mm-hmm. like minimal at the same time. So it's kind of hard to shop stuff like that. So I'm yeah. trying to find like very specific homes for those yeah. tracks. Gotcha. So yeah, just like focusing on just doing that. I, I was I was talking to a bunch of my friends and I was like, hey, I, I like DJing out and stuff like that. But I'm trying to just like more focus on like who wants to book the stuff that I'm doing right now. Mm-hmm. So I'm probably going to take a little backseat from DJing as much and just hone in on this sound that I'm creating. Yeah. What are some of the labels that like, you keep an eye on? Like, not necessarily that like, you're, like, sending music to, but just, like, ones that you, like, you know, keep an eye on. Yeah, so actually right now, one of the labels I, I signed a record with, like, a few, like, maybe, like, a month and a half ago is called uh, Kush.me from uh, from New York, actually. That's one of the labels that, funny enough, I sent them the music 
with like complete intention of being like, hey, I'm gonna start sending to labels that I really want to get to, and they actually picked up my records, which Damn. is fucking weird as shit to me. It was like my number one on the list, and, and I sent it. them, and they actually picked it up. So not the song that I actually thought they were gonna take Damn. either. Completely not the songs I thought they were gonna take. But uh -huh. that's always really nice, you know, yeah. when somebody appreciates your music. Um, really, it's weird because for a person who's so into music, like I, I, I barely remember the names of labels until I'm like in their email trying to send it to them. <laughs> so like, I love little yeah. helpers, obviously. Like, there's a there's a few of them, but yeah, I've been I've been actually just reaching out to more like underground labels, like labels that have like two, three releases. I just like the music that's on them. Mm -hmm. Like uh, one of the labels that actually had contacted me from. Uh, I want to say they're from, uh, what's this called? Uh, from Australia. Okay. Um, shit. What's, how can I forget the name of their the label right now? Damn. All right. I'll, come, I'll sidebar yeah, to yeah. this. I'll probably just say it randomly while I'm playing because I'll remember it. And I'll just pick <laughs> yeah, up the probably, microphone yeah, and say yeah. it. For that. Um, but as a label head, what is your uh, process in, in, like, if somebody sends you music, um, like, what's your process in, like, you know, well, now with second. Never Forever Before, we were a little bit more open-ended, which was kind of like the thought process behind it was just to sign anything that I liked, not genre-specific. Yeah. But that gets really hard to market. Yeah. So that was the problem that I kept on running into is just like people don't really know what to expect. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just like trying to hyper-focus on like a very niche sound when we relaunch. And it's just probably going to be like Dark Minimal and Electro. Okay. So if you send me the tracks, I'll always listen and I'll just be very blunt and just say like I don't. I don't think I want to sign the record. Like yeah. I'm, I'm pretty straightforward with it. Yeah, yeah. But most of the time, I, I really haven't. Honestly, I don't think I've gotten any bad demos before. Mm -hmm. So most of, most people are actually like way more talented than they realize. Yeah, their music's super fire, and everybody now produces like crazy. Like it makes me feel bad, kind of, because like my first like <laughs> five years of producing was like absolute fucking garbage, <laughs> and now everybody's like just pumping out heat. I meet people and they're like, "Oh, I've been producing for two months, and I hear their songs. I'm like, you're fucking amazing. Like this yeah, shit sounds yeah. crazy." My shit was terrible for like years. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I mean, it takes a long time. Uh, what are like some of the like um, the artists? Like, where are some of the artists that have been like sending you uh, stuff before? Oh, that so uh, yeah, have a uh, bro. A lot of uh, really a lot of amazing artists down here. Um, uh, Friday night, actually tomorrow night, Baruri is going to be playing. He's been doing a lot of stuff with me. He's been producing a lot of music recently. Uh, one of the homies, Gabo Rio, he owns Impression, which mm -hmm. is a minimal label. He yep. produces crazy ass music. Uh, my boy Luke Lethal in St. Pete and in the cool. Tampa area, he does more like techno nowadays, but gotcha. we've been working a lot like in the past. I think we're going to start working on some new music together. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people. I've been working with uh, these guys, Sunnyside. They're from, uh, they live in Hollywood as well. They're, they're really dope artists. They have like more of that like UK kind of vibe with those thick bass lines and like those uh, rolling uh, bass lines, like kind of like that Piv style. They're really doing some cool shit with that. Yeah. There's a lot of artists, like way too many artists down there. <laughs> Everybody's really fucking good too. I love it. So it's like hard to name everybody without like trying to forget people and stuff like that. I don't yeah. want to make anybody feel bad or anything. No, like I feel you. I mean, it's not a naming, it's not a quiz, you know. It's just like, yeah, yeah. It is what it is, yeah. All right, well, I mean, I appreciate you coming out. Um, I, I love the conversation. There's a lot of cool stuff we went over. Um, so for all like the music and all the stuff you got going on, where can people find you? I'm always on uh, at Instagram, the Audio Manipulator. You can hit us up and Never Forever Music as well. We're going to be doing more parties now. So July and August, well, mostly August now, we're probably going to be doing like three, four parties a month because I ain't got no work. So there you go. I got to make some money, man. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's always a struggle. All right, well, I appreciate it. And yeah, come out on Friday or whenever you can. Yeah, yeah we're doing it music. every month, twice a month. We're going to yeah. have a rooftop on Saturday, too. It used to be called Rose of Sky, but now it's called uh, The Twisted Tonic with my boy Hopeful Joe and What's Up Productions. So if All you right. guys want to do a cool rooftop party, my friend over here, Contigo, is going to be playing as well. There you go. We're going to be down, holding it down downstairs with some funky vibes. Upstairs, they're going to have some like deep tech and, and some maybe some minimal. I don't think so, but mostly like deep tech. <laughs> we'll see. You know, they, yeah. we, we can get weird, you know? Yeah. We do our thing. Pull up. It'll be a good time. Uh, see you guys there. And let's go to the decks. Peace.